This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. And I got two or three things. Yeah, let's hear Give the Lord a hand. That's great. Um, so we had some people mention last week about voter registration. You know, probably most all of you, it's kind of hard not to get registered to vote these days, but if you're not registered to vote, and this is not a partisan comment, regardless whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever, you ought to vote. And so if you've not registered to vote, we want to make it easy for you. So if you'll leave, to, when you leave today, if you go uh, into the lobby, uh, and if you'll just go uh, out there, uh, we have a QR code at our Next Steps table. Just go out to the Next Step table. You go to that QR code, and you can register to vote before you walk out in the parking lot. We'd like to ask you to do that. And then uh, our TV ministry, Touching Lives, they came up with this idea. So we've written a little book called Finding Peace in the Political Storm, Five Biblical Anchors for American Christians. And so it's a good little book. If, if it is mine, it's a good little book. And if you'd like to get a copy of it or you'd like to give it out, it'd be just a good book to give some of your neighbors and friends. Uh, if you'll go out to the lobby, go to the right, I'll be glad to sign a copy for you. And, and that's out there in the lobby for you. And then what I'm most excited about is Sunday nights. One of the things that, that I don't ever want to get too old to do is be willing to change. And so our, our next gen has been working and praying. And so we're going to go to Sunday nights and we're going to have our kids meet and our, and our teenagers meet and we're going to have adults meet. And it's a great change for our church. It's a prime opportunity for parents to either come and serve, which we need you to do, or be discipled in a small group. It's going to give us a better culture for evangelism. There are a lot of people out there we found, they're not going to get up early and come to church on Sunday morning, but they don't have a lot going on Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. And so I want to invite you to come and be a part of this. We think it's going to be something that's really going to be great. Now, if you are a guest of ours today, or you're watching for the first time, we started last week a little mini-series, two parts, that we're calling Political Correctness. And uh, I, even though it really isn't about politics, and I know you just mentioned the word politics in church today, or really anywhere, you can divide the house in a heartbeat. But as you saw, I hope, last week, and you'll see this week, we're really not talking about politics per se. But that said, it kind of puts a somber mood because you don't know what I'm going to say and you're worried. If you're a Republican, you're worried. Democrats, you're worried. You're an independent. You say, man, I want you to be careful. So I thought it'd be kind of good to lighten the mood a little bit, bring a little humor to what could really spark a, a, a forest fire, an argument in an instant. So let me give you one take on this phenomenon called politics. Just think about this. The opposite of pro is con, so the opposite of progress must be Congress. <laughs> just, just a thought. Here's another one. What is the difference between death and taxes? Congress doesn't meet every year to make death worse. <laughs> How are politicians like diapers? They both need to be changed regularly and for the same reason. Why doesn't the government display a nativity scene every Christmas? <laughs> they can't find three wise men. <laughs> What's the most unfair thing? And I, I, I agree with this one. What is the most unfair thing about American politics? <laughs> we get 50 choices of Miss America, but only two for the president of America. <laughs> Here's the last one. You know how they say nobody can fix the economy, nobody can be trusted in foreign policy, nobody knows how to get things done, nobody's perfect. We all say that, right? Well, that's why I'm voting for nobody. All right. Now, we've been talking about the relationship of Christians to politics, not just unbelievers, but primarily believers. And I said last week, there really are two parts to the topic. So one is, and this was the question we raised last week, how should followers of Jesus relate to our political leaders in government? And if you were here last week, uh, you'll remember, if you weren't, I'm going to tell you that last week you said that we are, our major responsibility for our leaders is to pray for them. You don't have to like them. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to support their policies. But if you are a follower of Jesus, we are obligated to pray for our leaders. You can vote for whoever you choose to vote for, but at the end, regardless of who wins, whoever is put in the office, we're commanded to pray for them. So last week, we talked about what I call God and the governor. But today, I want to shift our focus. I want to talk about God and the government. 
Now I want to talk about, okay, I told you how we're to relate to the government, but how is the government to relate to us? Now let me again stop and under, so we understand. Just the word government, if we're going to be honest, it just doesn't conjure up positive thoughts in a lot of people's minds, right? I mean, listen to this. Truth, this is true. Four out of five people in America have a negative opinion about government. Now, when I read that, I thought to myself, I wonder what's wrong with the fifth person. <laughs> the Pew Research Center released a report recently. Only 22% of adults have a favorable view of the government. As a matter of fact, the five worst rated institutions in America today, all of these have less than 20% confidence. This is, this is in order from, from, the, from the least worst to the worst, okay? Newspapers, the criminal justice system, television news, big business, Congress. Congress, you ready for this? It's the only one in single digits. When they ask people, do you like Congress? Do you like the job Congress is doing? Do you approve of Congress? Only 8% of Americans said they did. 92% of Americans basically said, throw them all out. We, we don't like them at all. And, and frankly, I'm reminded of something Ronald Reagan once said about government. I think it's the best statement I've ever read. I love this. He said, government's like a baby. An alimentary canal with a big appetite at one end and no sense of responsibility to the other. <laughs> now, the truth of the matter is you can run, but you cannot hide from talking about the government or hearing about it. You can't get away from it because there's one thing you can count on. I, listen, I don't even looked at the news today. Guarantee you something's in the news about the government. Maybe it's an economic report. Maybe it's an update about foreign affairs. Maybe it's the gloom of the soaring national debt. Maybe it's a Supreme Court decision. Maybe it's congressional legislation. Maybe it's a White House press conference. But every day, government is going to be in the news. You cannot get away from it. And frankly, I, I think we will all agree it's, it really is a mixed bag. Because here's the truth. And, and, and this is what I'm going to say, and I think you'll agree with me. There are some things about the government that I like. And there are some things about the government that I appreciate. And there are some things about the government that I'm glad that they do. On the other hand, there are certain things about the government I don't like and I'm not fond of and I don't really support. So as you think about how the government relates to us and how we relate to the government, there are two questions that come to mind, at least for believers. Number one, what does God's word say about government? That's what we ought to be wanting. Not even what the Constitution says. What does God's word say about government? And number two, what does God's word say about how the people should relate to the government? So with all of that as a background, I want you to take your Bibles, take God's word or your cell phone or iPad or whatever, and I want you to turn to the New Testament to a book called Romans, easy to find, four Gospels, Acts, Romans, sixth book in the New Testament. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 13, because we don't have to wonder what the answer is to those questions. Paul is in the city of Corinth. I've been there many, many times, and he's writing to the church in Rome. And you have to go back 2,000 years to understand that what he wrote to these people in Rome was absolutely eye-opening and jaw-dropping. Because keep in mind, Paul's writing to both Jews and Gentiles. Now, they didn't agree on a lot of things. But there was one thing that the Jews and the Gentiles had in common. They didn't like the Roman government. They were no fans of the Roman emperor. You say, well, why is that? Well, there were a lot of advantages living under the Roman authorities. I mean, there, things were really good in a way. There was a universal peace. People were mostly safe. They had a tremendous system of roads and economic times were basically good. Society was stable. What was the problem? It was a dictatorship in effect. It was an authoritarian government. Now, things were great if you were a Roman soldier. But if you were a Jew, you were not a Roman soldier. If you were a Gentile, most of you were not Roman soldiers either. And if you were not a Roman soldier, you were up the creek without a paddle. Liberty was limited. Justice was swift. It wasn't always just. And if you were not a Roman soldier, you basically had no rights at all. You were the lowest person on the totem pole. And then Paul comes along and has the audacity 
Some would even say the arrogance, maybe the insanity to write the words that you are about to read. And they were hard to swallow. They were hard for a lot of people to get over. They were hard for a lot of people to digest. And you're going to see why in just a moment. But here's what Paul is going to tell us and tell them. The God that gives us grace also gives us government. The God that gives us grace also gives us government. So now we're going to raise the question, how should we relate to the government and what should they do for us? I'm going to share with you three quick things. Number one, we must acknowledge the God-given authority of government. You don't have a choice. We've got to acknowledge, we must acknowledge the God-given authority of government. Now, let me just tell you something about Paul and I have something in common. He would not have made a good politician. And neither would I, all right? I just, I don't, that's just not my gift. I don't have the gift for it. Because you say, well, why doesn't he? Because he just gets right to the heart of the matter. There's no double talk. There's no double speak. He doesn't really set things up. He says, look, I'm gonna tell you how it is. So he begins in Romans 13, verse one. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Let me just stop right there. People are already gagging. They're already getting hot under the collar. Their veins are already bulging out. You've got to be kidding me. Let everyone be subject to the governing authority. Why? For there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities, rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Now, Paul's confirming a very simple principle. And that is that the authority of all governments and all governmental leaders everywhere comes from God. By the way, that's true of every government everywhere. It's true of a republic. It's true of a democracy. It's true of a dictatorship. It's true of a capitalistic government. It's true of a communistic government. It is true in a government where the bells of freedom ring loud and clear. It's true in a government where the bells of freedom are muffled in silence. As a matter of fact, when you read through the Bible, this is what's really interesting. In fact, you'll really see this in the Old Testament. And it's really hard to really digest even for me. And I've read the Old Testament through, I don't know how many times. But here's what you'll find that's so perplexing. You'll find so often that God oftentimes will put good people in power to be a blessing. We get that. But then sometimes God allows evil people to be put in power to be a curse. It's strange. And, and the thing that all governments and all governmental rulers have in common is this. Their authority is given by God and God alone. Now, I don't want you to hear something I'm not saying. I am not saying, and Paul was not saying, that the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Putins are approved by God, or that God is responsible for their behavior, or that their authority is never to be resisted. That's not what Paul is saying. He's just simply saying, look, I don't care what kind of government it is. I don't want, care what kind of a leader it has. There is no ruler. There is no dictator. There is no president. There is no king that has any authority in himself or of himself. It all comes from God. As a matter of fact, you may, may remember something Jesus said in Matthew 28. We've read it many times, but we don't realize even the political implications that Jesus said of what Jesus said. He said this. He said, all authority. Now, what does that word all mean? Can somebody tell me in one word, what does that mean? Yeah, it means all. <laughs> Great, you're doing good. All authority, not some, all. Name any kind of authority you want, economic, financial, political, militarily, judicial. Jesus said, all authority, all authority has been given in heaven and earth, has been given to me, it all comes, it all comes from me. I mean, every single part of it comes from me. So for example, great example, Jesus is standing before Pilate. Pilate thinks, buddy, I've got, I hold your life in my hands. You, you better pay attention to me because I'm the one that's going to decide whether you live or whether you die. I've got the authority to kill you. Remember what Jesus said to him? you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. See, a government, a government leader can use authority. A government leader can misuse authority. 
But what a government leader cannot do is manufacture authority. All authority comes from God. So I know when I look at this world, every government in power today is there for one of two reasons. Either God put that person in place personally, or God allows that authority to be in place. One of those two things have to be true. And the leaders of these governments, you say, wait a minute, what about these people that don't acknowledge God? They don't believe in God. They hate God. God is nowhere to be found on their radar screen. They don't want God anywhere around. As a matter of fact, they even persecute people who believe in God. I get that. But the only power they have, the only authority they have is that which has been given to them by God. Now, having said that, don't draw another conclusion. That does not mean, oh, so I've got to always obey the government. I should never resist the government. That's not what that means either. So how do you know? Because when you study scripture, you realize if God, if government ever commands something that God forbids, or if God ever forbids something that God commands, we have a duty. We have a responsibility as followers of Jesus to resist and disobey that government. And I know that because it happened all throughout the Bible. Great example. Jesus had been raised from the dead. The apostles, Peter and, and all the apostles are out in Jerusalem. They're preaching the gospel. The civil authorities don't like it. The sheriff doesn't like it. The mayor doesn't like it. The city council doesn't like it. So they call these guys in and they say, hey, you've got to quit preaching the gospel. Here's what they said. We must obey God rather than men. Sorry, guys. We'll obey the law. We'll obey you. We'll be under your authority. But if you ever command something God forbids or you forbid something God commands, we're out. So whatever laws are enacted that clearly contradict God's law, civil disobedience is not just an option, it is an obligation. I'll give you another example. If you remember back when, when in the story of Moses, Pharaoh had ordered all the Hebrew midwives to kill all the newborn Jewish baby boys. And if they refused to obey, they would die. But they disobeyed and Moses was born. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is when King Nebuchadnezzar commanded that all the people fall down and worship this golden idol. You remember that story? Well, there were three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love that story. Because when Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar said, boys, everybody's going to bow, they looked at him and said, Neb, we may burn, but we will not bend. And we will not bow. And we will not break. And years later, when a king named Darius passed a law that said, for 30 days, you cannot pray to any God except me. You got to pray to me and nobody else. The Bible says the first thing Daniel did was, if we heard this two weeks ago, he went to his room, threw open his door so everybody could see, and he began to pray. So I'm not saying that we have to just lockstep everything that the government says we need to obey. As long as they don't do anything that God forbids or God commands, that's great. But with that said, all I'm saying is, I'm sorry, this may hurt you, it may bother you, but we've got to acknowledge that any governmental authority is God-given authority. Not every governmental leader has been, appointed, been anointed by God, but every government leader has been appointed by God. That's what Paul says. But then he says there's a second thing we must do. If we want the government to relate to us and the government relates to us and we relate to them the way we should. Number two, he says we must appreciate the God-given responsibility of government. Now, there's always two sides to the coin called authority. With authority comes responsibility right? If you've got the authority to do something, then you have a responsibility that goes with it. I tell young pastors all the time when I talk about how to lead a church, and I talk about delegation. I'll say, guys, there's one big mistake a lot of pastors make, and it will get you in trouble every single time. Don't ever give someone responsibility if you don't give them the authority to carry it out. That's why my, my leadership style, I'm, I am the opposite of a micromanager. Now, I'll get involved in details when I need to. But my philosophy has always been you hire people that know more about what they're doing than you do, and then you let them do it. You give them the responsibility to do their job and give them the authority to carry it out. Well, with authority comes responsibility. And so Paul says, let me tell you what the primary responsibility is of all 
government. You ready? Watch this. He says, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority Then do what is right? You'll be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant. Don't, don't lose thought of that. Think about that. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. Now that is a mouthful. But what Paul basically said was, I can tell you in one single simple sentence what every government leader's job is and what the job of government is. Here it is. The primary responsibility of government is to do right for those who live right. That's the number one responsibility of government. You are to do right for those who live right. And, G, and, and, and Paul uses a phrase three times. It's really interesting. Three times to show us that not only does government have authority from God, they have the responsibility to use that authority for the goodness of the people and for the glory of God. As a matter of fact, you could call it a ministry. Because in verse four, two times in verse four, the government is called God's servant. And then to nail the point home, Paul goes back in verse six. Here's what he says. They are God's servants. Now you might be interested to know that the Greek word there for servant is the word diakonos. We get the word deacon from that. So this is not trying to be funny, but in effect, if you work for the government, you are in effect a deacon. And what does a deacon do? Well, the word deacon also means servant. A deacon is someone who serves. So every government official, whether you're a mayor, a city council member, a governor, a senator, a congressman, a president, makes no difference. You're a servant. You're a minister. And let me tell you something a lot of people have forgotten. And this is not a political statement. It's just a true statement. We've really forgotten this. It is not the job of the people to serve the government. It is the job of the government to serve the people. And we forgot that. And that's why you got a lot of arrogant people. They're like Barney and a bullet and Barney and a badge. They get elected and get a title and then they act like we owe them. They act like we ought to serve them. No, no, no. I'm not your minister. You're mine. I'm not your servant. You're mine. Now, you may think it's kind of strange. Wait a minute. You mean you don't think of politicians, government officials as, as ministers or servants? Let me tell you something that we say every day here and over in Great Britain. They don't even think about it. So where do you get this idea that, you know, they're, 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 that, these, that a, a, a governor is a, a deacon, a governor or a president is a servant, or he is a minister? All right, watch this. What is the leading official in Great Britain called? He's called the prime what? Where do you think they got that idea? They got it from the Bible. Or how about this one? What do, what do politicians love to call themselves? Oh, we are public. Where'd they get that idea? From the Bible. They're exactly right. He is a prime minister. He is the number one minister. His number one job is to serve the people of Great Britain. The governor, the president, the congressman, our senator, our mayor, their number one job is to be our servant and to be our minister. Officials were meant by God to serve and minister to the people they represent. By the way, Paul specifically lays this out in verse four. Listen to what he says. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. So the primary role of government is to do good by the people, for the people, and to the people. But now we got to get the devil in the details. Well, how do they carry that out? So what does that mean? What does the government do? What are the things they do that are supposed to be good for us? Well, Paul didn't miss words. He says, okay, I'll tell you. There are three things any government has a responsibility to do. So I'm going to give them to you in order. All right. They've got three jobs. Number one, they're to prohibit law breaking. Number two, they're to promote law keepers. And number three, they're to punish law breakers. That's what they're to do. They're to prohibit law breaking. They're to promote law keepers and they're to punish law 
breakers. So the primary job of government is to establish, you'll hear this phrase a lot, the rule of law. That's their job. We're going to pass the rule of law. We're going to pass laws that hopefully will condemn evil. It will prevent evil and also it will promote. That's what, what is good. So there are two sides to that coin. Government is to promote law keepers. So listen again to what Paul said in verse three. He says, rulers hold no terror for those who do right, for those who do wrong. You want to be free from fear of the one in authority, then do what is right and you'll be commended. I'll give you a great, great example. You're going down 985. I go down 85 to work, go down, come down up 95 to church. The speed limit is 70. Now, if you do 70, or a little secret, if you do 80, they won't bother you. I do 80. I have no fear. We we're, were going somewhere uh, three days ago. Teresa and I were going somewhere, and she said, I, was on, I had ways. You, if you ever use ways, they'll say, police ahead, right? Teresa says, hey, there's police ahead. I said, no worries. I'm only doing 10 over. They, they, they'll wave at you as you go by. Do 13 over, get a ticket. So all I got to do, okay, whatever the limit is, I add 10 to it, and I said, you can say, well, you're breaking the law. God forgives me, okay? But listen, that's the primary job of the government. It is to pass laws that would prescribe and, and condemn, condemn people that break the law and to, 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 you know, to praise people that don't. By the way, that word commended in, in verse 3, it literally means to praise. And so what Paul said was, look, if you keep the law, you obey the law, you submit to the law, you ought to be, you'll be in good standing. You'll have the favor of government authorities, and that's their job. Praise good people. Promote people who keep the law. Punish people who break the law. So verse 3 begins, for rulers who own no terror, for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Now, that word terror is a very interesting word. It's the root word that gives us the English word phobia. And what Paul is saying is, Part of the job of government is to strike fear in the hearts of anyone who would do evil or even think about doing evil. Because Paul goes on to say this, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, be very afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Yeah. They are ministers, but they carry a sword. They are to walk softly, but they carry a big stick. By the way, the Roman sword was an instrument of punishment. So now we know what the government's supposed to do. It has the primary responsibility to protect its citizens from criminals and to punish criminals who attack the citizens. That's what's called the rule of law. So that's why we have courts, and that's why we have policemen. And that's why we have jails to protect us from enemies within. That's why we have an army and a navy and an air force and marines and a coast guard to protect people of the nation from enemies without. And oh, by the way, while we're in the neighborhood, let me just teach you a little theology. The reason why we need government to protect people and the reason why people need to hold the government accountable is something that people forget, people don't believe, but it's true and it blows my mind. Most of the world today believes people are basically good. They are not. People are basically bad. And if you don't believe that, have kids. <laughs> Your kids were no different from mine. <clears throat> I did not have to teach my kids to lie. I had to teach my kids to tell the truth. My dad didn't have to teach me not to, to teach me to get along with my brother. Uh, not to get along with my brother. He had to teach me to get along with my brother. Why? Because we're not born basically good. We're born basically bad. We're born basically selfish. We're born basically self-centered. And contrary to what the Pope recently said, and he was dead wrong, the heart is not fundamentally good. The heart is fundamentally evil. And that's why James Madison was correct when he wrote these words. Listen to these words. He said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed. 
and, to the, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. That is why, by the way, even the poorest form of government is better than no government at all. So when an official of the state uses the sword to, to protect human life, to defend the people, it is inflicting God's wrath and God's punishment on the evildoer. And that's true whether it's policemen, a policeman defending us against a criminal, or a soldier defending us against an enemy. So buckle up. That's why we should not defund the police. That's not defending bad police officers. But defunding the police is not the answer. And that's why we should never dishonor the military. Do they always get it right? Nobody always gets it right. But they are God's instruments to protect us, to promote what is just, to promote what is right, to punish those who disobey the rule of law and to protect those who keep the rule of law. So we must appreciate the God-given responsibility of government. We must acknowledge the God-given authority of government. But then Paul says one last thing. This is one part of the sermon I just wish I could just cut out. Because I'm going to be honest, I don't like it either. But here's what Paul says. <laughs> we must accept our God-given accountability to the government. All right, so we're going to wait a little bit in deep water here. You ready? I want to remind you of something, just in passing. The only way we can have good government is if we put good people in leadership positions. But the only way we'll put good leaders in government is if we, the people, are good enough to vote for good people. Now, you may not like that, but that's just the truth. The reason why we have such a big, bloated government is not just because of the leaders who have made big, bloated government. It's because we, the people, put those leaders in office to begin with. So before you look out the window, look in the mirror. Charles Colson was one of the most famous convicted criminals of the whole Watergate scandal. He came to Christ while he was in prison. He made this observation. He said, in any society, only two forces hold the sinful nature in check. The restraint of conscience or the restraint, the restraint of the sword. Now listen to what he said. The less that citizens have of the former, the more the state must employ the latter. A society that fails to keep order by an appeal to civic duty and moral responsibility must resort to coercion, either open coercion as practiced by totalitarian states or covert coercion where citizens are wounded and voluntarily giving up their freedom. Now, let me summarize what Mr. Colson said, who was a dear friend and a brother. Let me just summarize what Chuck Colson said this way. The better the people are, the smaller the government you need. The better the people are, the smaller the government you need. But the worse the people are, the bigger the government you need. Now, with responsibility comes accountability. God-given accountability to government. So what is our accountability? Okay, here we go. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is the part I don't like. This is also why you pay taxes. Taxes. I hate that word. I, I, I'm just being, I, if, if you don't hate that word, something's wrong with you. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to govern and give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If you revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. I told you last week, we're not just accountable to pray for government. And I don't like to say this, but we're accountable to pay for government. And I'm, for one, I understand it, it's a touchy subject. Paying taxes is a touchy subject. I'm going to be very honest. It is a battle for me to have joy in the Lord on April the 15th. It's just a battle. It's just hard. I'm just being honest. I don't like to pay taxes. And a lot of you don't like to pay taxes. I get it. I mean, I, sometimes I feel like the wealthy businessman. He's on his deathbed. 
just about to die, he looked at his wife and he said, uh, when I die, I want you to have me cremated. She said, oh, really? He said, yeah. She said, well, what do you want me to do with the ashes? He said, put them in an envelope, send them to the IRS, and tell them now you have everything. <laughs> Nobody likes to pay taxes. I get it. You don't like it. I don't like it. But at the same time, remember, we're not allowed to get to support our government through our taxes. We're to pay the taxes that we owe. But by the way, here's, this will maybe will help you. In reality, if what Paul said is true, you're not just paying taxes to the government. You know what you're really doing? You are actually giving your money as an act of obedience to God, who's the authority over the government. Because the two most important qualities any government can give us. The two most important qualities we've got to have as a nation are these two things. We've got to have security and we've got to have stability. And the only entity that really can give both as a nation to us is the government. That's their job. And by the way, our founding fathers got it. They understood that. They, they, they really did. Because even in the preamble of the Constitution, this is what they said the government's job is. It is to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote, not provide, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now, we all agree with that. We all say, yes, that's great. And they were so wise and they were so good. And we're so glad they put that in there. But there's one little catch to do that. A cost has to be incurred. A price has to be paid. So in effect, let me tell you what your taxes are. You ready? Your taxes are the cost of living in a free country. That's the price you pay. That's the cost. You incur nothing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And so for the freedom that we enjoy, for the government that we have, we pay our taxes. Even as we pray for our government, we are to pay for our government. But that leads to one last thing. And I was trying to think as I did this two-part series, okay, I don't want to wind this up. And I said, yeah, I need to go back and visit, revisit this. Yeah, I've got a responsibility to pray for my government. And I have a responsibility to pay for my government. But I also have a responsibility to, to participate in my government. Christians don't get a free pass. I, and, and by the way, we, we joke about politics. We've got people in, in our church who are in politics. I'm grateful for you. I really am. I, anybody that chooses to throw their hat in the political ring, I mean, you got to admit today, you got to be really, you got to really have some courage to do that, right? Because you're going to get hammered one way or the other by half the people anyway. But people who are willing to, to really engage in public service, I want you to know, really, my hat's off to you. I have deep respect for you. And by the way, I really do believe, you, you can laugh at me if you want to, I believe most politicians are good people. And I mean good, I mean, I think they mean well. I think they want to do what's right. I think they want to do what's best. Even some of the ones I don't agree with, I, I think a lot of them, I think they're sincere. But at least they're engaged. At least they're, they're riding the, 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 the bull in the rodeo. At least they've got, you know, skin in the game. We ought to be in, engaged in the political arena, arena. So as God calls for it, yeah, we ought to run for, for public office. But all of us ought to vote. That's not just a civic duty. It is a sacred responsibility. Now, let me just say this. This is my little soapbox, and I'll wrap this up. The only wasted vote is the vote that you don't cast. I don't see anything in it. You correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm not telling you how to vote. That's not my point. I don't see anything in the Constitution that says you have to vote for either for that guy or that guy. I don't find that in the Constitution. This is not Ukraine, and you're not Putin. I can write in somebody if I want to, but I do and I go vote because the only way to vote is the one that's never cast. But I thought, okay, now how am I going to wind this up? I said, I know how I'm going to wind it up. Don't ever preach a message, Adrian told me. Don't ever preach a message. You don't get back to Jesus. So this is the last thing I'll say we're going to pray. You're not going to win every vote you cast. I haven't won every vote I've casted. I voted, from, I voted for some people that made it to the presidency. I voted for some people that didn't. I voted for some people who was elected governor. I voted for some people that didn't. But don't ever forget, 
the greatest vote you will ever cast in your life is for the one who died on the cross and came back from the grave. Because when you vote for him, you vote for you and you receive eternal life. So would you pray for me right now with heads bowed, with eyes closed. And you know, as we pray, I wanna do two things. First of all, I just would like to ask, have you ever really cast your vote for Jesus Christ in your heart, with your life? Have you ever realized that without Jesus Christ, you're lost, you're a sinner? Have you ever realized that Jesus died for you and came back from the grave so that you might be saved? that you might be forgiven, that you might have eternal life, that you might go to heaven, that you will go to heaven when you die? And knowing that, have you ever come to a point where you say, I not only know it, not only believe it, I'm gonna commit myself to it. If you're watching right now online or by TV or you're in this room and you've never given your life to Christ, let me just tell you something. A vote, if you do not vote for him, you voted against him. You may say you, didn't, you cannot straddle the fence with Jesus. And if you today would say, you know what? I want to cast my vote for Jesus. I want to cast my vote for the one who died for me, for the one who came back from the grave, for the one who wants to save me. Then why don't you just tell him? Why don't you just say something like, Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you as a sinner. I need salvation. I'm not basically good. <laughs> I'm basically bad. I need to be saved. I need a savior. I believe you're that Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. I repent and turn away from my sins. I give all that I am to all that you are. If you prayed that prayer and you did it online or watching it on TV, if you would just, if you would just kind of go to your computer or iPad and just put in www.acrosspointchurch.com slash next, just crosspointchurch dot com slash next. We want to hear from you and help you get started in your walk with God. If today you cast your vote for Christ, if today you gave your life to Jesus, when this service is over, would you go out to the lobby to that table called Next Steps where you can also register to vote, by the way? Would you go out to that table and just say, I want you to know today I cast my vote for Jesus. I, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. We just want to help you get started in your walk with God. You know, when you get baptized, you're casting a vote for Jesus. When you finally join a church you keep coming to week after week, you're casting a vote for Jesus. When you get involved in a small group, you're casting a vote for Jesus. When you find a place to serve, you're casting a vote for Jesus. When you allow us to send you out into your neighborhoods and your business and your, and your schools to be a witness for Christ, you're casting your vote for Jesus. So Father, my prayer my prayer today is that nobody would leave this room, nobody would get in their car, nobody would walk out of that parking lot without knowing for sure they've made the greatest vote they'll ever make. We do pray for our government. We do pray for our governmental leaders. We do pray for those who are in office and those who will be elected, knowing at the end of the day, all authority comes from you. So Lord, we pray about you blessing us and we do want you to bless our nation, but God, if you're gonna bless us, you need to bring us to repentance. You need to bring us back to righteousness. And that's the end of our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.